Well, ladies and gentlemen, let us start this second part of, the, of, the, of our program. And um, let me introduce myself. My name is Strömholm, uh, Stig Strömholm. I'm former Vice Chancellor of Uppsala University. And uh, I have been asked to act as moderator of that part of today's program, which deals with politics and poetics, or more precisely, with power and its symbols, or even more precisely, with the question of how to find the adequate uh, symbolic expressions of power. And I very gladly accepted that function of moderator, the more so since um, it would seem to imply on this occasion that such uh, with speakers of such uh, eminent quality rather a peaceful and a passive role. Now, uh, peaceful I will be, but let me only raise, to start with, uh, by way of uh, introduction, two points, which I hope will be dealt with in one way or another, either by Professor Gloria Kaiser and Mrs. Daru Harris and Sir Lean in the course of their presentations, or by them in the course of the, the, the discussion, or possibly by other discussions in the exchange of views, which I hope will follow. Now, the first inevitable point would seem to be what kind of power the initiators and, and um, organizers of this seminar have chosen to refer to in their quest for a symbol. Strictly intellectual and cultural power or a broader concept, including economic and political power. I need not add that in the case of Queen Christina, it's obvious that both these um, areas are concerned. In fact, they are closely intertwined with a strong accent, a stronger accent on the political aspects in the early years, a stronger and more exclu exclusive emphasis on the cultural elements towards the end of her life. And what applies to Queen Christina also applies to Princess Europe. Now, a second equally inevitable question is what useful or at least reasonable function um, symbols can assume in the secularized and heterogeneous uh, Europe of today. Considering, as an example, the highly variegated use of symbols in the ochlocratic chaos surrounding the European football championship contests that currently infest the media, uh, uh, European media, it seems important to find uh, one or more, one or more reasonably well-defined answers to that question. Is it really worth trying? to find answers which are acceptable with regard to all parts of our continent and to all the generations presently living there. I beg leave to insist more particularly on the generation problem, which may well be more important than that of national or religious or economic and political differences. Sometimes, I must admit, when reading literary articles in the most advanced style by young Western intellectuals, not to speak about modern musical productions, I feel that a European university man of 80 years is likely to have more in common with a Bulgarian peasant or a Portuguese fisherman of his own generation than with the, these young authors whose lucubrations I'm trying to penetrate. Now, this feeling obviously gives rise to very thorny questions, but we will know very much more about that in an hour and a half or so. Now, I would like to suggest that I give the floor to our um, the, the speakers in the order of Madame Kaiser, Monsieur Parot, uh, no, it's English, je regrette, ce serait au. Le français serait peut-être plus naturel, mais on y va maintenant. Monsieur Parot, uh, Harris and Monsieur Soline, in that order. So please, Professor Kaiser, you have the floor is yours. And I excuse, I will sit here to keep an eye on you and yes. to because I'm old and I have to sit. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, yes, a couple of words uh, for sure in general about Christina and the politics and about Europe. Uh, the development of the human being is always the same. The me wants to withdraw and the me is urged to develop itself in seclusion. And at the same time, our me is always looking for a community. And in this area of tension, we have to live. So we see seclusion and connection, retreat and community. 
uh, with the, we see that the wish, the strife for connection, for unite um, with another is indestructible. You, um, Europe, Nietzsche called it the small peninsula of Asia, we know, and that is the historical development of the European idea is at least as old as our era. We know the Roman Empire with the Latin language and Latin culture was the first attempt to unite the nations of Europe. The Roman Empire collapsed. The wish for unity, for unification of the nations remained. And centuries came in which almost each nation of Europe attempted to gain control of a united Europe. Always they strived for control by military power, and for that reason there were always wars. Not until the past century, in 1948, with the European movement for the promotion of the European idea with the goal of the United States of Europe. Excuse me, interrupting. Yes. Do, you, uh, do you hear? Everybody is this, hears. Is this, yes. All right, then go yes. on. <laughs> <laughs> was their success after two world wars in placing the idea of European unity of a new foundation, unity on the basis of an intellectual and cultural principle. For only, as we know, the kind of thinking should be decisive to live and think as citizen of Europe in case of, or in the sense of Erasmus of Rotterdam. And this means recognition of national individuality and subordination of government customs and the administration of justice to only one single goal, for peace. So how could we find all these qualities uh, in one single person? And I think we find all these qualities in Christina of Sweden, because uh, Europe is thrown back and forth and throws is back and forth itself, but it is one continent and it is one Europe. And the many languages, the many cultures have one thing in common, and this is the shared continent of Europe. And now I will come very short. Queen Christina of Sweden, the European or a European, she had command of the European languages, we heard this, and as a result, she constantly wandered in several European cult cultures. She was tied to the European nations through her travels, through correspondence, through individ individual people. For example, Sweden, here was, she was born, Germany, Netherlands, France, this is clear, Austria, Italy, Poland, Especially we Austrians have to think and to recognize Johann Sobieski in 1668. Uh, he followed uh, the abdication of King Johann Casimir Vasa of Poland and then, then she, he offered uh, the Polish crown to Christina of Sweden and Christina declines, but then she came in contact with the Lusitanian culture, with Portugal, through the Jesuits, Antonia Vieira, and also to Spain. And all these cultures, Christina lived. So the question, do we know Christina, the politician, the lover, the philosopher? For sure, we don't know Christina well enough. At uh, some time, uh, the historical figure, Christina, I think she was put to silence. Nonetheless, if we concern ourselves with her, we become acquainting uh, with a fascinating human being, Christina the politician, who was constantly a peacemaker, Christina the lover, she knew the storms of passion into which a human being can be cast. And Christina the philosopher, we think on René Descartes, and also of Antonio Vieira and the smile, for example, of Democritus' his wonderful texts. And is Christina modern or is she relevant? Of course, Christina lived as a European, and she is modern because she is timeless. So her power as a symbol, as an emblem for Europe. She was not an imitator. She didn't react to trends. She went her own free way and translated masculine and feminine traits into her own language of life. 
And with that, she also became an unmistakable expression of her time, of the 17th century. So I only can repeat, Christina lived like a phoenix, her favorite mythical animal. And the phoenix, which in perpetual rejuvenation rises out of the ashes again and again, the spiritual power of the person Christina Vasa is still far from exhausted. She continues to have impact up into our day and a phoenix that shakes its purple gold plumage and wings its way into the air rejuvenated to seek the abducted and wonderful Europe. And also one sentence, what I find during my research confirmed time and time and again, the surest measure for each force is the resistance which it surmounts. And I think this is proof, the whole life of Christina is proof for this strength that she had. This is my first speech. Thank you, thank you. You obviously are for Christina. Yes, for, yes, some for, yeah, for sure. Of, <laughs> of course, well, of course. It's a simplify the thing. Uh, uh, I remember an anecdote from the end of the First World War when the situation was extremely confused in Russia. There was a British expeditionary force in northern Russia. And uh, they found a situation of such confusion that before, when they met the troop, they could be white Russians, they could be red Russians, they could be anything really. So the commander, in, uh, the, the British commander ordered his troops to put the question, whenever they met the armed people in the forest, are you for or against the King of England? And the answer would determine their course of action. Now, uh, you are obviously for. Queen Focus, Christina, yes, as a European <laughs> symbol to, to simplify radically. Very good. Thank you indeed, Professor Kaiser. And then, I, are there any questions of a sort of uh, simple, knowledge-oriented kind, or a more philosophical one, I think, can came, come later? Any questions? No. If so, I ask Professor Daru Aris to go on with his presentation, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I will try to bring the point of view of a semiotician. Don't be afraid. I will try to avoid uh, any technical term and uh, remain, uh, I hope, clear for uh, everybody here. Uh, I, I want, uh, if you, if you allow me to to speak, of you don't hear long fifteen minutes. They, exactly, that's a question I put. Uh, please, be a little closer to the mouth. Closer, yeah. Yes, yes. put it near to your mouth. Yes, I, I, I want to develop three points. Uh, the first uh, point, a few semiotic comments about relation, relations between politics and uh, symbolics. You hear me? Yeah. yeah? Uh, the, uh, you, you, you know how... Uh, how uh, symbolics is uh, I essential to the political power to obtain the recognition of the politic power. Uh, I think that the term legitimiz legi legitimization is not correct. Uh, legitimization you can use, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not beautiful, but I, it can I be used. I prefer recognition. It, it's e easier for me to pronounce. Okay, the second point, uh, is uh, the, the critical and quick stock-taking of the, of the European symbols and their obvious inadequacy today. And the third, the main point, is the, the uh, examination, semiotic examination of the great figure of the Queen Christina and its possible conformity agreement with the requirements descri describing a main symbol of the European cultural unity. And I want here to thank uh, Jan Kerlo uh, because of the lecture of, of his book. I was a little angry with Christina because of the premature death of René Descartes. <laughs> I'm living in the town of Tours, we have three great figures, François Rabelais. Christina is not responsible of the death of François Rabelais. Uh, Honoré de Balzac, uh, who died because of the 
use excessive of coffee. Uh, and uh, René Descartes, uh, just, just uh, one year in Stockholm, when he, he was the tutor of the Queen Christina. I was a little angry and I changed completely my mind after uh, having read the, the book of uh, Jan Gerlo. Thank you for you. Okay, I, I, um, I begin by first point. Uh, from a semiotic point of view, the first question for me is the, the, one, the one of the federation. The union of two individual agents, in uh, the semiotic word is not agents, but actants, but it's not important. The, the union in a collective agent to share beliefs, values, and support common actions. I, I think the, the first question is, is the one of federation, of constitution of a collective agent, of a collective agent in the cultural dimension. And I think it's very courageous, courageous uh, today to, to, uh, to have a reflection in the cultural dimension when we are waiting for the result of the election in Greece, and there is the, the, the dimension um, very important today, economic, financial, but I, I think it's my thesis that the, the solution is cultural and not financial nor economic to, uh, to resolve the, the problem of European Federation. Uh, so, uh, if you want to, to uh, collect peoples in a collective agent, uh, it's important that the distinctive particularities of the agents, of the individual agents, are suspended in order to give the first place to the common shared intersection. And I want to give you a concrete example of the constitution of a collective agent. Uh, perhaps you know the architecture of the Opera House of Paris, uh, built by Garnier. Uh, to reach the huge hall of the opera, everybody must use the long and monumental stairs which appears as a plan of corporal federation to aggregate individual persons into the collective agent of the public, uh, which is necessary to create the space of performance. It's a, a very concrete example to constitute a, a collective a, a agent. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I know it's very difficult to, to build a, huge stair where peoples, European peoples, uh, use and, uh, and uh, succeed to constitute a collective agent. I want to, to give you a quotation out of, uh, of a very uh, good, uh, good book uh, of François Forêt. Uh, a Belgian, uh, the title is in French, Lég Légitimer l'Europe, uh, Pouvoir et Symbolique à l'ère de la gouvernance. Uh, we, are, uh, we are in the subject uh, of today. And it's my, my unskillful uh, translation, excuse me. He, he writes, in any case, if you don't want to go out of the democratic theory, the condition of the recognition is the consent of the population joining freely a power which is not based on coercion as first means. Politic symbolics constitutes a main medium of that recognition. Belongs to politic symbolics everything or system of sins overloaded with significations, operating in the double novel, it's very important, in the double novel, cognitive and affective, 
as reactivation of cultural codes of behaviors. I think it's a very, very good quotation to, uh, to, to clear uh, our problem uh, today. If coercion creates the pragmatic dimension, the dimension of strength, the pure re relationship of power struggles, the symbolic dimensions, dimension, excuse me, joins cognitive and affective. And here comes for me the second question, the one of the irreplaceable strength of symbolics to obtain that federation, that collective actant, since the strength of cohesion is not sufficient and refused by the choice in Europe of the democratic value. So the cultural dimension is really essential for, for us. Yes, uh, just a comment about the power of, of the symbol. Of the symbol. We, we must uh, distinguish, uh, I think, symbol, emblem, and allegory. And I think that the term of allegory is not correct. To, to have a discussion uh, uh, about uh, Christina as main cultural symbol in Europe because allegory, it's the, often the human representation of an abstract idea. Allegory of justice, allegory of vanity. And uh, I think we, we cannot use the term of allegory um, in, the, in the case of the choice, the eventual choice of Christina as the main cultural symbol for, uh, for uh, European culture. Uh, the power of symbol, it's an other quotation of the book of François Forêt. A uh, symbol is by nature polysemic and not monosemic. Not one signification, but uh, several significations together in the symbol. And uh, the symbol allowing personal and plural interpretations. It is a way to realize union even when agreement don't exist. It's very important, even when agreement don't exist, the symbols, the symbol allows uh, uh, to realize union. It constitutes for the power a main stake, a tool for making see and shape the unity of the group. And uh, I, I want to, to add that uh, the symbol is not only means of domination, but also uh, of dispute against uh, the establishment. Uh, you, you have in, in your mind, uh, I think, the, the example of the American flag. And uh, the American flag uh, burnt or uh, even washed <coughs> by s some people. Uh, the, 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 the flag is a symbol, a symbol which is a means of dispute also. also. It's very important to, uh, to, to say that. Um, the second point, uh, very quickly, uh, I, I want to, to, uh, to say that we, we have uh, from a, a semiotic point of view, three, uh, three uh, categories of political, political symbols. First, the behaviors. The rites, ceremonies, coded, juridically coded, and also the daily gestures with political signification. Public spiritness, civics, consumption of media, and commensality, it's a first kind of political symbols. Uh, second uh, category, uh, the linguistic facts, all the oral and written discourses. And the third, the objects, monumental architecture, 
uh, statuary uh, and more modest things, flags, clothes, uniforms, iconography, currency. And uh, I think in the dimension of political symbols, nothing is rigid nor definite, definite but everything is not possible. Uh, it's a paradox. Hmm? And the cultural material constrains strategies and, and actors. Uh, and there is a, a tension between the lack of rigidity, but everything is not possible in that symbolic dimension. Uh, the, the symbolic production is not a, a sector based politic among uh, others, or a technical question devoted to specialists of communication. The symbolic production has to do with the foundations of the popular consent and to the theoretical and concrete modalities of the life together and of the definition of the we, the, the problem we. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I see that the European Union hesitates between uh, two, two solutions. Uh, first, uh, uh, about the, the cultural union of the European peoples. Two solutions. The, the, the first uh, solution, the, the great solution, I, I think Christina brings to, to, to us the great solution of the, the cultural union, perhaps. Uh, the, the quest, the, the search of the great, great founder tale. Uh, uh, in, as semiotician, uh, I like very much the, the term of tale, the, the, the narrative dimension of, of culture is the main dimension for the semioticians. And I, I will show uh, in a few minutes how the, the tale of the life of Christina is a uh, semiotic symbols, marvelous semiotic symbols. So the, the quest of the great, great founder tale and the second solution uh, is compromises less ambitious and pragmatic uh, searching uh, cultural solution. But we, we, we must, we must uh, try to uh, impose the great, the great uh, founder tale, I, I think, to succeed uh, in found, founding the cultural union in, in Europe. Um, well, uh, my third point uh, is uh, the examination, uh, a, a little quick, but we, we may uh, after have a discussion about that third point. If the, the, the semiotic and not historical, the semiotic examination of the great, great figure of the Queen Christina and uh, its possible conformity uh, with the requirements describing a main symbol of the uh, European cultural unity. Uh, some uh, features, semiotic features, uh, I think a life shows an exemplary narrative trip, a canonical narrative one. The trip of the, the hero who breaks with the familiar space in order to conquer the unknown <coughs> world as an utopic space and to conquer a new identity and a glorification. And the glorification of the hero never, never occurs in the familiar space. Never. You must, you must go out 
of the space to, uh, to join a new space, an utopic space, and that utopic space for the Queen Christina is the space, the world space of Europe. Europe. Uh, it's a, a trip opposite to the one of the traditional tale because the royalty, the statute obtained at the end of the traditional tale, is lived, is lived by the, the Queen Christina at the beginning. And her life is dominated by the presence of a total freedom and the absence of that the semiotician calls a dresser. Uh, she belongs to, uh, to uh, th there is no addresser in the tale of the life of the queen. She is as free as possible in, in that period. She is, uh, I don't know if the word exists in English, incontrôlable, incontrôlable. Nobody can control, control her. And uh, she uh, don't uh, come back I I in Sweden as a queen. She, 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 she comes back to Sweden, yes, but not as a queen. And uh, I, I want to, to point uh, also the, the figure, the act of, of conversion. I, I think, excuse me, that the, the conversion of the Queen Christina is not, for me, a, an act of faith, but, but uh, uh, something completely else. Completely else. Uh, at the beginning, the problem of Christina, in spite of the conversation with René Descartes, eh, the, the, the tale of Christina is completely stopped. Completely stopped. Her life is stopped. She's waiting for her husband. She, 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 she d d does not uh, choose. Eh? And I, I think that the conversion and the abdication is the mover of, of the tale. The tale, the tale, uh, the tale uh, uh, be begins, a new tale begins after a, a complete stop of her, of her life, considered semiotically uh, as a tale. A tale. It's the, 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 the conversion is the mover of the tale. And it is uh, an, an argument very important to, uh, to consider the Queen Christina as a, a main symbol of culture in Europe. Europe. Okay, she, um, she leaves uh, the country because of, the trans of, the, of a transgression. And we know, we know as semioticians that the transgression is the great mover of the tale. If you have no transgression, you have no tale possible. No tale. Well, uh, remember the legendary figure of Saint Martin. It is the saint of my town, and also the saint uh, of the town of Buenos Aires. Saint Martin, Saint Martin was uh, uh, the uh, Roman legionary in, in the Pannoni, actually Hungary, yeah? and he, he becomes Christian, and uh, he is a, a great figure of Catholicism, of early uh, Christianism, because of his conversion. And I, I think that the Queen Christina is in a, a, a very important semiotic position in the point of articulation between different words. The word of prote Protestantism and Catholicism, and she, she is protecting the, the poor Protestant uh, aggressed by, um, by the Dragonade in French. Uh, she's um, in the, the position, uh, in the articulation also with the Jewish word, 
with the, the orthodox word, and it is a very, a very, uh, a position very, very rich uh, from a point of view, uh, or Semitic point of view. Well, uh, 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 last uh, but not uh, least, uh, last uh, uh, comment, semiotic comment uh, uh, about the the life and the tale of the life of, of Christina, the continuous travels of the queen, cutting across the whole Europe during her life. And uh, I, I try to, to constitute the list of the countries, but I'm, perhaps I forget. I forget one or two, uh, but it, it is uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, France, Italy, Germany, Hungary, Poland, and, and more, uh, and more. So uh, the, the troubles allow her to appropriate by a corporal experience all the European space. It's for me very important for a, a European cultural symbol to, 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 uh, to have that experience corporal on the, on the roads, uh, difficult roads at that period <laughs> in Europe <laughs> and all the dangers uh, possible, yes. She, she shows uh, also uh, an exceptional intellectual precocity she has an exceptional culture and an insatiable curiosity without any limitation in, in the fields of arts, music, painting, sculptures, literature, sciences, theology, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy. And uh, she conversed with uh, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Newton, and many, many, many others. And, uh, uh, so, um, I, I think for all these reasons, for me, all these semiotic reasons, the Queen Christina could be the incarnation, because we, we, we are lacking, lacking today in Europe by a lack of embodiment, of incarnation of the politic power. Uh, in Brussels, you, you have no embodiment of, of the power. The, n n nobody can imagine the body of the power in, in Brussels. Huh? <laughs> no, nobody, no incarnation. Uh, and it is a, a very important lack to constitute a, a true federation, a true legitimation of the politic power. So she can be the incarnation of a European cultural symbol because of the polysemy of that symbol and because of the very powerful narrative symbol of Christina, uh, because of her position, position in, the, in the articulation of so many, 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 many words. Thank you, for Thank you Professor Darrow Harris. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you are obviously for the Queen of Sweden, <laughs> this particular respect. And um, uh, on grounds which I think are most interesting, uh, which need to be discussed, I'm grateful for your ex uh, coming, coming to, in, in the course of your explanations, the, the precisely the, the function, the use of symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm entirely of your view that allegory is not the proper word here. Incidentally, before I give the floor to Professor Sörlin, I recommend strongly uh, the audience to read the Svenska Dagbladet today. There is an excellent article on Christina in it, so you will know very much more about her tonight than you did yesterday evening. Now, Professor Sörlin, on you go, and you must be, after all, in favor of the Queen of Sweden, otherwise you are a traitor and sitting in in the royal palace and uh, would be. Well, I, I have just uh, uh, thought about that uh, and to give you my, my side. I, I, is it on?
So is it better? This is better. Okay, well. I, I suppose I just want to say I, I will have to be for her. And I, I, I think in a sense I am for uh, her also because uh, I think we are conducting a little bit of a thought experiment here today. We are, we are testing the idea that w maybe we could find in Christina a symbol um, for Europe, perhaps lacking one. And this of course is an issue that in, in this part of the world, in Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, is talked about with some uh, more um, uh, concern and, and perhaps uh, um, curiosity than, than elsewhere in Europe, simply because we have such a problematic relation to Europe. And, and uh, there, there is a, always a sort of a, an ambivalence and uh, an oscillation between uh, f for or against, uh, and we always uh, seem to seek uh, ways out of responsibility. Uh, for example, by not joining the Euro uh, as one example. And uh, having been involved for, uh, it's a while ago now, in, in the late 80s and a good deal of the 90s in, in a sequence of research projects about the relationships between Scandinavia and uh, the rest of Europe, uh, I think I, I see this with even more clarity. That this is perfectly through, true, all, all, all through. And uh, one particular expression of that uh, may be referred to, just to, to remember, and that was by the former uh, Swedish Prime Minister of Tage Erlander, who made a famous talk, or you would say infamous if you like, uh, to one of the major, major trade unions uh, sometime in the, in the late 1950s. It was the Metals Workers Union, but really one of the biggest, and he talked about Europe. Uh, Europe was on the move. Uh, th there was the formation going on on what, what was really to become the, uh, subsequently the European Community and European Union. And he asked the question, should, should we be there? And he, he was uh, somewhat tempted, of course, because uh, Europe represented great learning and all traditions and all, all of that. But there are so many dangers in Europe. It's the three C's, or K's, it would be in Swedish, Catholicism, capitalism, and communism. Uh, and all, all evils emanated from this dangerous continent south of us. So let's stay up here and let's stay a little bit content with that. Uh, and you can use that as, I think, as a kind of... Um, if, you, if you have a symbol here, really talking under the kind of re uh, representative, calm, modest idea of staying close to Swedishness uh, and carving out the political future based on that uh, idea is is quite important to remember. And <clears throat> we could note, for example, in the current uh, reigning party, if I may say so, it is an alliance, but the biggest party is the, is the Conservative Moderate Party, they used to be pretty articulate on the European issues. They used to be even, even spearheading the uh, discourse of the European idea and so on. Now in power, they stay much more calm on that issue. They find problems in Europe. They are doubtful. They are so I think we, we see even people are prepared to change their mind just to be not totally pro-European uh, um, uh, these days. So I think we, we, in this part of the world, we should conduct such a thought experiment with, with some extra attention. Uh, I'm very grateful to the previous speaker for bringing up the idea of uh, symbols and, and uh, the semiotics uh, because, of course, after all, it is an important thing. And we could go back to the uh, big uh, uh, names in the history of anthropology, for example, or others, people have studied nationalism. We find symbols all over the place. Raymond Firth's um, uh, important work and many others, Benedict Anderson and all of them, the whole range of studies of nationalism shows the importance of um, of national symbols, and they have played an enormous role. Um, and um, the, um, um, the, the same is true for Europe. And however, I think to, up to this point, we've had a discourse on symbols in Europe which has been quite superficial. We remember back in the 80s how, and early 90s, of course, there was, if you want, you can say Jacques Delors was a symbol of Europe. Maybe not so colorful as, as, uh, as maybe Christina, but, in his, and during his period and into the 90s, there was a lot of discussion about symbols. Should we have a, we should have a, a big hymn? We'll have a flag? We, we need more European symbols. But it stayed on a very technocratic level. 
It was kind of a, f a game without fantasy, and there was no anchoring. They even needed to bring in Margot Wallström to mobilize more popular support for the idea of Europe, which of course shows the extent of the disaster. Uh, but I would like to say that here it is not just a matter, uh, I mean, with all respect for the semiotic side of this, it is not a branding issue. It is not just, you cannot go to a, a consultants with public relations firm and ask them, now come up with some good symbols and let's communicate them. That's the wrong approach. So in a sense, I think uh, Wallström's mission was very important in the sense that you need to anchor this, but you need also to bring in the political content. It's a political idea to talk about. It's a political issue, not a branding issue. And uh, then I think, uh, and I will come now to a number of, of points where I, I would like to argue for <laughs> Christina as a, as a good uh, idea and a symbol for, for Europe. Um, and tomorrow you can organize a new conference that I can talk against, but uh, uh, today we're here and we, I will not be a traitor. Uh, and I would like to juxtapose, to begin with, the technocratic approach, which I just uh, described, which also, I think, goes very nicely, so to speak, hand in hand with, with another understanding of, of Europe, which is basically neoliberal. It's about markets. It's about freedom. It's about simple mobility. Let's build more roads and let's uh, just to increase economic growth. It's a sort of one version of seeing this. And if you have that kind of basic idea of Europe's progress, that's just about making money flow better. Uh, then, of course, if you were interested in a symbol, uh, you, you may go for quite superficial ideas. I would like to argue that on the other hand, we have a totally different alternative, which is more existential, cultural, uh, deeper anchored in the uh, rich fabric of Europe and its past and its diversity and so on. So when you approach the whole idea of choosing symbols and, and bringing that uh, up as a, as a deeper uh, political uh, and almost existential issue, you should be aware of, of uh, these things. To the extent also that names have been provided in previous discourses who are representing, representative of Europe, you, you tend also very commonly to come up with people from continental Europe. Voltaire, for example, wow, he would be the great European, Montaigne, uh, you'll find an Italian here or, or, or a Spaniard there, but mostly French, I think. But you, when do you hear of a, 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 a British representative of Europe? It's sort of a contradiction in terms. And I think in the same way, the contradiction in terms of finding a people from sort of a Norwegian to represent uh, Europe, you, you need to think hard uh, to, to sort of internalize that uh, animal. And, and um, uh, but that's, of course, why we should be particularly interested in, in Christina. Now, um, I think one should note about Christina uh, of, as a, I will now give a couple of characteristics of, of her that, that I think um, uh, are uh, useful here. One would be to, to just denote her as a hybrid person. She's a hybrid. And I think that is the epitome of modernity. Today, everything is going hybrid. Nothing is really what it seems to be. It changes all the time. She is really a representative of that fundamentally modern and contemporary uh, idea. And I think that is also basically why we're here today. We, we sense this. There's a play coming up I read somewhere on the web. Maybe it's already been uh, started, I don't know. But uh, a young, sensitive author like Sara Stritzberg is now interested in Christine as a personality, writing a play about her, so setting up on Dramat and I. I heard, and then uh, so, and we also read in 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 uh, in the in the in the various uh, sexual cultures and uh, communities. They they trans personalities take an interest in Christina because she's she's just a trans figure. Uh, we don't need to buy into, and we shouldn't probably for sheer scientific reasons, into this old uh, S.A. Muller argument about, uh, you know, that her being a hermaphrodite and all of that discussion. I think that's, that's now part of the past. It's, 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 it wasn't true. But I think what remains from that is this fundamental ambiguity. We find here a person who, 
who doesn't really neatly belong in any fixed camp. She doesn't wear a hat. We don't put a hat or a crown on her and she just expected to sit there. She's prepared to, to change her mind. And I think that's another very, she's prepared to live with change. Her entire life is a life in, in change, accepting change, uh, grappling with change. And I think that's also quite, quite uh, important here. Uh, she's also creative. I think, of course, not everybody is an author. Not everybody perhaps want to become an author, but football players and everybody now seems to be an author. And, and she was also an author. She wrote herself. She was, an, uh, she was a creative person in her, own, in her own right. I think that's quite important. It's also very important to note her broad cultural interest, not just as a, as a phrase she was interested in. Culture, she spoke languages, we, we all know. But she also made an effort. She collected. And I think the collecting, the, the, the deliberate effort to actually put Sweden on a par with the rest of Europe by bringing here the libraries, the collection, the uh, Rudolf II's uh, collections, and you can discuss on what terms they arrived in Sweden and why and so on, and certainly, but, but, but they, they arrived, she was in charge, she wanted them to be here, she wanted to lift the nation. In a certain sense, you could also uh, and I represent Folk University, that, as you know, turn into the sort of an arch saint of folk building, to, to bring the level up on the uh, way, way avant le mot, so to speak. But the, the, so we find all these traits in her. Uh, to, to bring up that first little word that uh, was mentioned uh, by Stig Strom, secularization, to, to talk about our, our time as more secular as well, we used to think that way. I don't think we do that anymore. Religion is here, it's persistent, it's even come back with a Renaissance quality, so to speak, and a strength that is sometimes very even frightening, but it is here. And you, again, you need to live with that as well. And certainly she did live with religion. You can discuss to what extent, uh, as the previous speaker did, she was really, uh, really a, a, a believing person. There w might have been other, uh, dimensions that came even up as more important to her. But, but she, she was, in that sense, a real politician in, in the sense that you, she also needed to, to live with religion, live with change, and l embody change, which I think, again, points to something which is also a heritage from this time that still is part, very much part of European identity and should remain so, which is the ambiguity and the doubt. The doubt, that the, the, the Cartesian doubt, what did she pick up in these few months with this man? Well, uh, not much perhaps, but I think she was clever enough to, to pick up that I, the very basic ideas and that you needed to go into yourself and take your decisions and be responsible for your decisions, doubting. I think that's very important as well and sort of brings uh, another facet to the hybrid personality. And then uh, one thing that is still very difficult is this issue with women and science. Uh, the propagators of science, all the ministers and so on and so forth, they all, oh, we have more women in science, that we should have more school children. She already in the 17th century was herself a woman, accepting, acknowledging science, wanting science to be brought here. And the kind of personalities she brought were represented a wide range of, of scholarly and scientific specialties. Um, the, um, uh, the arts, of course, the languages, uh, librarians, Bordelot, the me medical guy, for example, uh, various uh, Dutch polyhistors, Fossius, the younger, for example, and uh, and you you would find also uh, people representing um, well, basically. The, uh, my own favorite, of course, is Johannes Schaeferus, the. The, uh, the, the man who then also brought uh, knowledge and scholarship even further north and wrote a big book called Laponia, representing the far north. So bringing Southern Europe and Northern Europe uh, together. These people also represented many nations. So in a sense, she was hybrid there too. She, br she was transnational. She didn't care about uh, limits. Then she was also a extremely um, uh, capable. She managed her own, I mean, she didn't lead a simple life. She took the, the difficult road and she tried to manage big affairs. And she, well, a few losses here and there, but, but basically uh, she managed to, uh, to do that as well. So 
I, I think we have here a personality carrying a number of capacities that are quite contemporary, quite um, uh, modern, if you, if you like. Her, her court became more or less a mosaic of European culture. And also by choosing religion and choosing to depart from a religion, I think she also, in a sense, speaks to the current very central problems of European identity with multiculturalism, multi-religion, multi-everything, and she represents a way of dealing with that, um, leaving a, a, a faith and, and crossing over that transgression that the previous speaker so, I think, importantly stressed, and this whole idea of utopian space. Although I would say that perhaps the classic idea of the hero is also that you return to your own place, having been on the other side, so to speak, and bringing that. She really, really never came home to Sweden. Although she was here, she, 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 she was never received. And I think, in a certain sense, we have not yet received her. I think the moment of reception is still to be, to be held. We, and in a certain sense, perhaps, this thought experiment is also, it's not just about testing Christina as a, as, a, as a symbolic figure for Europe, it's also a testing of her final homecoming when we could, so to speak, uh, elevate her really for the, uh, to the European level and cho choose her, uh, if not as a queen, so at least as our modern Swedish European. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Serlin. Ah, all right. That's for the three of them. Um, well, just one word to defend uh, the possibility of Norwegian Europeans. After all, Ibsen wrote his best pieces in the Hofgarten in Munich. So, I mean, there is something. Even Norwegians can be Europeans, although it's hard to see. Now, um, that was, I think, a very interesting point, in, uh, if I may, uh, it will not be long, uh, in uh, Professor Lee's uh, uh, presentation, namely the idea of uh, living in change and uh, implying sort of more or less incarnating a life in change. Uh, I may be old fashioned, <laughs> I probably am, but I think if there's anything symbols should represent, it's endurance its value, its perpetuity. And um, I think uh, a symbol which is sort of characterized by its changing character seems to me a very risky operation. But uh, this possibly corresponds to the present situation in Europe. And, and uh, but then it will not serve for uh, forever. It will probably be a, a, a new change after that. But it's, you, you are probably right, of course, in saying that, Christina, the, the very mutability, the very uh, 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 her, her lack of, in a way, of, of stability in some respects is, is obviously very still. But uh, uh, no, sorry, oh, just one more point. She did return to Sweden, but to uh, negotiate about money, which I think, after all, is not a very dignified return. Uh, she got a very, very substantial income, as you know, from uh, various provinces, and uh, that wasn't eno enough, really, for the kind of life she led. And, and uh, uh, I think Queen should live on a rather uh, glorious scale, but she <laughs> overdid it a little. Didn't she? Well, uh, may I come back here and say that, first of all, defend her uh, again, really, uh, and now against you, uh, to say that she didn't get all sh that she deserved from the kind of arrangement that was made. I th at least in my superficial learning about uh, Christina, I I think she only got about a third of what she had expected. So she was rightly returning to, debond, to demand more. <laughs> uh, and of course, she had some expenditures for all her collections of lifestyle and all of that. And I think another key word maybe of our time that I think is coming up from the sciences really and is, is spreading more and more and sometimes abused is the word resilience. In a certain sense, I think we not, not just want symbols, we also want resilient symbols. And resilience means really that your capacity to, to change, to, to live, adapt to, to, to stresses outside. And I think that is also a capacity that she carries. She certainly was under stress many times and had big, big troubles, but she constantly survived. Again, the phoenix symbol comes up again as an interesting idea that not just, if, you're, if, you're, if you stay with certain values, you are bound to succumb. Thank you. Well, uh, would any of the speakers, uh, the, the uh, first speakers, comment on the intervention of another of the speakers, or shall we uh, 
Well, shall we ask uh, the audience? Yes, please, sir. My name is Farrell. Of course, being very interested in pictures and films, I wonder about the American movie with Rita Barbo uh, acting <laughs> as uh, Queen Christine. Uh, will that movie forever, will that very famous movie forever influence our picture and image of uh, Rita Barbo? Or, 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 or Queen Christina. And is uh, that movie too glamorous? Uh, or what's your opinion? All right. Is any of you who is prepared to give an answer to that? Given the general level of education of the public, I'm sure it will have an influence. But well, I would, I would like to to test an answer. I would say no. Uh, the, the, um, uh, we can make a new movie. And that, would, that glorious image would fade. And um, uh, in fact, it was so many years since I saw it that I hardly remember anything. But the, the, uh, there, is, um, there is this, uh, I think there is this opportunity to, to renew a portrait. And, and uh, there's already a long sequence of portraits. That, of course, is perhaps one of the most pervasive since it was Hollywood. But, but still, uh, Hollywood can have a new chance, perhaps, or even Paris can. <laughs> More intervention, yes, please. Could I give you some support? A big support in your work, finding an emblem for Europe. The famous book of Robert Musil, Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften, because it's, uh, it's a kind of the best European novel so far, ironic and filled with um, ambiguity and also about trying to find union in a split Europe, the split between Hungary and Austria. And he, he really, it, it's known to be hard to read, but I do really recommend it from the bottom of my heart. You can read nothing more about the work of a symposium, the work of finding an idea, and the impossibility and the ambiguity and being the first European, really. So have a good lecture, all of you, because you will never forget that book. I promise you, it's highly European. And uh, you know, don't know about Musil? About? He, Robert Musil. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Do read it. As Horatio say, do read it during the night, do read it during the day, because he is highly important for all your aims. Have a good time. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So the could be absolutely the symbol yes. <laughs> for yes. Europe. So thanks so much for um, all these interesting talks. But I, I had some, I don't know, some, some ideas, but I think they all came up, my ideas, but I, maybe I want to uh, put them a little bit further. Um, first of all, I like the idea that um, identity building should be a process and should be an open process, because usually if we build a we, we also create the other, the outside. So I think it's very important to see um, symbolization not as an end point, but as a process. And it's always a um, contested process. So that's why I like the idea of hybridity, because um, Christina, of course, is a hybrid, or we construct her as a hybrid person, where you can have a lot of um, feelings, emotions, effects um, on her. But she's also contested. You could also, you didn't mention it, but I'm sure you will say, why a monarch as a symbol for a democratic Europe? Of course, I like that she um, seems she seems to be a woman. She was a woman. She might be seen as a lesbian, as an intersex person. So there are a lot of identifications for people who do not that easily belong to the Europe. But I think I so I would like the idea of um, hybridity and contestation that might make her a symbol for Europe. So thanks for these ideas. The other thing is what I'm struggling with, and this was also mentioned on the podium, how can we think Europe, um, not only in times of crisis, but as a project which is also not only a cultural project, but also an economic project. And I think we have to, if we talk about symbols, we have to look at the current situation in Europe. Um, 
at the situation of a crisis. And if I look at, and this morning I just uh, learned again, we know it that 20% uh, of the people in Greece um, have no jobs. They, they can't go to hospitals, they don't get any medicaments. So how can we combine our idea of finding um, a symbol for Europe with this um, disaster economic situation um, so, yeah, maybe that's a question. Thank you. Good uh, I, I saw more hands in the air. Yes, please, uh, madame. We were talking about Greta Garbo and her um, adventures on the silver screen, and of course one of the interesting objects in that film is the replica of the silver throne, and of course, if you look at Queen Christina today in Stockholm, almost the only thing left of her in public view is the silver throne. And it will, of course, be very much valued in the future when we have a new uh, queen uh, sitting on the throne, uh, hopefully. Uh, but I want to uh, draw your attention to Queen Christina's own search for symbols. We have been talking about the phoenix bird, uh, which I very much like myself. And it was used after the Monaldesco murder when she was trying to come back to power and she really saw herself as, as rising from the ashes, being burned down to the ground and then coming back. But she also has in her program, in the Histoire Metallique, several, several, several um, emblems that she wanted to use to uh, um, illuminate her own life. And among them is a paradise bird. Um, which is inscribed, from you what I wanted, which is, of course is another more content picture of her than the phoenix bird, which is, seems to be um, very troubled. And it's interesting that uh, in the Piazza del Popolo, one has used the Vasa Schiff um, on its decoration, and she also her, herself used the Vasa Schiff of wheat her ancestral oh, no. symbol as an emblem for herself, and you can see her books inscribed with this emblem. But apparently, this was not such a strong symbol in the end, because in Rome there are lots of um, weapons, uh, weapon shields Good from all long. kinds of families, Italian families. So what she ended up with in her, uh, in, in the big uh, um, uh, Lide Parade, and also earlier, on the Via del Corso is a big, huge crown. Uh, apparently, she reverted to um, her role as queen, as, as uh, using this crown symbol, a huge crown, which was maybe two meters in diameters, was um, uh, exposed on the Via del Corso, and also another one on her leader de parade. So you could see, say that uh, um, a lot of what she did was seeking for a suitable symbol for herself. And uh, in this sense, she herself is a kind of emblem seeker. So I just wanted to um, draw your attention to this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there were one or two more hands raised. Aren't there? Well, should we ask our panel or, or the podium for comments to what has been said from the floor? Are there any ideas here that appeal particularly to you or which you reject violently? Um, uh, thank, you thank you very much for this question about the economic situation in Europe. This is uh, a disaster, as we know. Um, I think, especially with my work about Christina, my research, and my idea about the Phoenix as an emblem or a symbol for Europe, I know a symbol is always a, a, also a dangerous thing because a symbol you can use in this way and in another way. Uh, perhaps we need, uh, we are in need of a symbol for this phase uh, in our history now, what we have to overcome. And we have also to split or to separate uh, the European Union, the thought, and the uh, euro crisis, these uh, two separate things. And uh, for sure, for the euro, I also am dreaming about they have the eagle dollar and we would have the phoenix euro, perhaps. Uh, we hope so. And uh, I think about all this crisis, uh, what we have, and we have, we have to deal now since 
uh, for, for, for a couple of years and for sure for a long time. Perhaps we also could find the answer in a text uh, which Christina created with Antoni Vera about the moral plague. And I think this is a suffering. We suffer at the moral plague today because uh, the, we have the results of a development of a down development in, in, our, in the moral of all these uh, things, what happened in the last five or 10 years, uh, I think we, we could find answers in her life. Reading this sermon about the moral plague uh, would be very helpful for us. We have to find a new basis for our moral attitudes, for our moral, moral values. And uh, to come to a result, I keep with my picture about the phoenix. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Daruru. Uh, just a, a comment, um, uh, a general comment. Uh, I think the, the main need in Europe today, um, the people, peoples are, uh, feel the, the lack of sense of signification. Uh, and uh, the lack of signification uh, produces, uh, I think, a, a lack of legitimization. Legitimacy. Yeah, recognition. Yeah. And uh, I have studied uh, many, many communities, many Indian communities in Brazil, uh, the community that uh, Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss visited uh, in the year uh, in the year uh, 1930, and uh, I'm very fascinated by the uh, the power of mythology in uh, these communities. <coughs> the whole world is in intelligible. Everything uh, has a signification. Uh, the, the, the word is understood completely by the mythology. And uh, I, I, I ask myself about the lack of European mythology. Perhaps we need more than symbols, but we need, uh, we need a, a mythology which gives sense the mythology gives sense to the past, but also to the present and the future. The time of mythology is unhistorical. And I, I, I hope, I imagine, that the Christina, Christina, more than a, a symbol, uh, can constitute a, a myth, feeding the mythology we, we need now in Europe. Thank you. Um, Professor Céline, would you add something? Yeah, well, just a couple of small remarks here. First of all, thanks for all the interesting remarks from, from the floor. And uh, I would like to pick up on what was said here about uh, her own uh, use of the crown as a symbol uh, or an emblem towards the end of her life. Uh, I'm certainly not a Christina scholar, so what I say here now cannot be interpreted in that way. But it just seems to me as as also a symbol not necessarily of, of, of being the, the regent or the reign of the queen, but also the symbol of, of that existential struggle, something that you actually have been in a deep relation to your whole life, and whether you should keep it or whether you should not keep it. So as, and I think that there is, has been some descriptions of this uh, decoronation moment and I think that is a pretty moving scene, isn't it? When, when, when she is lifting uh, the, the crown from her head and also how that is tied to the, the entire nation, if I may use that word. Of course, it was a kind of a proto-nation in a sense. Not every Swede was really so much Swedish. <laughs> but, but those who were assembled must have been this moment of, of deep emotional change. What is going to happen? It was a trembling. Um, moment, and <clears throat> I think that is also a p part of my understanding of her as uh, uh, as showing great courage. But at the same time, you never know whether your next step that you take is is the right one, and that's 
I think where, where we need to be resilient and flexible and, and choose our path forward. Uh, I think it's a great idea to, uh, to try and depict her. Uh, maybe that's what the new Garbo film should be about. It should be about uh, the, 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 her, the mythology of Christina for, for Europe. A lot of potential here. I'm really uh, full of expectations if that play that I talked about will ever be staged. Thank you. I think we have reached a point. In fact, it's, uh, it's 12.30, and, uh, which according to our program is why we should stop. So I think we are uh, most grateful to our uh, speakers who have taken the trouble of developing their ideas here. And I think there are every reason, there is also every reason to be grateful to those in the audience who have participated. And um, uh, let me resume that uh, obviously there, there is a strong cause for Queen Christina, some sort of European symbol. Uh, I should uh, possibly add this the reservation that, uh, in this country at least, which ought to be one of the countries where she is best known, I suppose a school child of 10 is not perfectly certain that that school child knows who she is. So uh, that is a weakness in a symbol. Uh, it may be a strong, also a strength. I would personally vote for Charles Lequin, but I realize he wouldn't be very popular. Uh, a symbol unknown to those supporting it is after all, uh, it's interesting, it may be, I'm afraid Christina is at the present moment uh, possible as a symbol for intellectuals. But uh, the, the hard question for Europe is who can symbolize what is common for the rest? And uh, if we suppose everybody here present can be called or call herself or himself an intellectual, the others are in majority. And uh, that has to be kept in mind uh, when we're choosing symbols. Uh, anyway, uh, we have had a very interesting discussion. We are grateful also to Monsieur Viard and Madame Nistor and all those who have organized this. I think we, are, we leave the room a little more wiser than we were when entering it. Thank you. <laughs>